Woe unto you. <laughs> I startled Susan. <laughs> Woe unto you. That's my theme verse. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. Take a minute and think about that. I wanted this to... I decided that this was going to kind of be my theme verse for my topic. Uh, first century authority in the contemporary church. Um, as I was going through, just in my regular Bible readings, I would frequently come across passages, uh, particular, mostly in the Old Testament, but a lot of times you would, I would find things that Jesus said in the Gospels, too making reference to passages in the Old Testament where you have um, God speaking through the prophets, sending messages to Israel, and in particular the leaders of Israel, and in particular the religious leaders of Israel. Especially during the times leading up to their captivity. Um, when, Israel, when, when Israel was practicing all forms of idolatry and um, the messages that God would send to these religious leaders regarding the way that they were treating the people. And not just the way that they were treating the people, but the way that they were taking advantage of the people for their own benefit. Um, and I was seeing a lot of parallels. The, the, the parallels just Rung, you know, just rung true. They resonated with me um, because of all the things that we have been discussing here at, at Tank and on Paul's passing thoughts uh, over the years. All the articles that Paul has written, the things that we have uh, seen come up in the discernment blogs and in the survivor blogs. We spend a lot of time here at Tank talking about authority. Um, we talk about men in modern Christianity. We talk about the who's who of Christ in Christian circles. Uh, who does your pastor quote uh, during their, in their Sunday sermons? Uh, when you're taking a, a, an adult Sunday school class, uh, Whose book are you studying this quarter in Sunday school? You know, modern Christianity makes a big deal about these so-called religious leaders. These are the men that we're supposed to look up to for some reason. Um, they're supposed to have all the answers. They tell us. They tell us we're supposed to be humble. We're supposed to be submissive to our pastors our elders, you know, uh, we go to their Bible conferences and we learn about things like cross-centered living, cross-centered marriages, cross-centered homeschooling, cross-centered this, cross-centered what, take any, pick anything, cross-centered counseling, you know, mm -hmm. take any aspect of, of life that you want to and then just throw cross-centered at the beginning of it. Um, so there's all these guys, all these big names in modern Christianity that we're supposed to look up to, we're supposed to obey them, we're supposed to submit them because they are the authority. Paul just spoke in his just this previous session about expertism. This, this idea of expertism that everybody is caught up in, hung up on. Um, they don't question things because supposedly these guys are the experts. Well, I wanted to kind of do a comparison, and that's my, that's my goal here in, in, in my session, but the topic for my sessions is make, making this comparison between these modern day church leaders, these modern day authorities and comparing them to what we see happening in the Bible and in case you haven't already figured this out or can't see where this is going you're you would be surprised the shocking similarities 
that there are between what is happening in Christianity today and what happened with the Jews, what happened with Israel, what happened in, even in first century Christianity in the Bible. Um, so to start out, I just want to take a quick survey of some of these uh, reformed big dogs, as some of them call them. Okay. <laughs> Um, see what we can find out about them. Uh, now we can have fun with this. I was, you can ask Hannah, I was putting my slides together <laughs> yesterday and, and, and I was just chuckling to myself uh, as I was putting it together. We can have fun with this because it's fun to ridicule these guys. Um, Hannah, yeah, Susan's wagging her finger at me. <laughs> but it, it's, it's fun to ridicule these guys. These are the guys we're supposed to look up to and respect, but when, as we examine their lives, as we examine who they are, it's really fun to ridicule them because they're worthy of ridicule, I think. Um, but at this, go ahead. Christ ridiculed the Pharisees. Yeah. He called them vipers. Yeah. He called them white sepulchers. Yeah. I'm sure he got chuckles out of the crowd mm -hmm. when he said, Woe unto you, you white sepulchers, yeah. you Pharisees. Because I'm sure the crowd knew exactly, the crowd knew it, yeah. And this is the type of ridicule you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we're not just mocking them and making mocking fun them. of them to put them down. I mean, we're, we're I guess we're kind of going to look at the hypocrisy. The hypocrisy. The hypocrisy of it. Of it. Um, so we can have, we're going to have some fun. I want to have some fun with this, but at the same time, um, this is a very frightening and a very disturbing proposition when you really think about what's going on here. Um, so let's get on with this. Let's start with our favorite, Mr. Mr. Piper. John Piper, retired pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He retired in 2013. Mr. Piper has a net worth of, as of, tw as of 2018, his net worth is recorded as $11 million. Net worth. Now, for anybody who's into accounting, if you understand net worth, that doesn't necessarily how much money he has in the bank. From an accounting standpoint, net, wor net worth is determined by assets minus liabilities. So assets are considered a positive, liabilities are considered a negative. So when you take like assets like money in a bank, property, things you own, stocks, bonds, investments, whatever, those are assets. Subtract your liabilities, which is, which is your debts that you have. So, so when you take assets and you subtract liabilities, you end up with a net worth. That's still a lot. 11 yeah. million. $11 million of net worth. Uh, according to Wikipedia, he is listed as having written 74 books. I think there might be more than that, but at least Wikipedia only had 74 listed of books that he's authored. Now, here's an interesting, uh, and that does not include articles that he's written on his Desiring God website. So, he's a prolific writer. The um, the income that he receives from his books, he doesn't receive directly. All the incomes from his books are filtered through a charity. He publishes, all his books are published under his Desiring God Foundation. Uh, his Desiring God Foundation is, is listed as a 501c3 nonprofit. That simply means they're record, required to file an IRS Form 990. So, any books that he writes, his Desiring God Foundation publishes them, and then the publishing com that publishing company, that foundation, that charity, receives all the income. And then his charity disperses that accordingly. Um, it would be interesting to follow the flow of money in that arrangement, just to see just how much exactly Piper gets from these books versus how many, how much money actually goes to ministry. Um, and of course, 
the main reason for doing it this way is there's a tremendous tax advantage to doing that as well. Um, so because of this flow of money and how this is filtered, by the way, um, if we were to do that in a secular world, there's a term for that. Anybody know what it's called? When you take income coming in from a questionable source. Money laundering. Money laundering. Yeah. Isn't that kind of like money laundering? Isn't that what criminals do? They take money in from their ill-gotten gains, and then they filter it through a, a legitimate true. business, but and on I the think, other end it comes out clean. But this is clean laundering. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, this, so it's hard to it's hard to determine what he actually receives from his book royalties because of this, how this money is filtered. Um, it's interesting if you go to the Desiring God uh, website. There is a, he did an interview and there's an article on his website called Millions Sold, No Money's Taken. He makes the statement in there says the reason he does it this way is to help. It's it's managed this way to guard against the love of money. So this is all so that he doesn't run the risk of being tempted by becoming greedy. That's what he says. Um, John Piper's affiliations, of course, he's, dis I already mentioned the Desiring God website. He is affiliated with the Gospel Coalition, uh, the Together for the Gospel, uh, or T4G. These guys, these two groups actually have I believe it's biannual meetings that they alternate every other year. So like every, so like odd number of years, I think you've got the Gospel Coalition meetings and the even number of years you've got together for the Gospel meetings. Uh, John Piper's theological and academic pedigree. He attended Wheaton College from 1964 to 1968, majoring in literature and minoring in philosophy. Uh, Piper studied romantic literature with Clyde Kilby. This stimulated his poetic side. And today, he regularly composes poetry to celebrate special family occasions, as well as annually composing story poems. These are based on the life of biblical characters. And he composes these story poems for his congregation during the four weeks of Advent. Uh, Piper was originally on the pre-medicine track, only he decided to go into ministry during a bout of sickness. And while listening to the sermons of Harold Ockinga over the radio from his hospital bed, so that's when he decided that he was going to change his majors, but he wasn't going to go into pre-med anymore. He then completed a Bachelor of Divinity degree at Fuller Theological Seminary. While he was at Fuller, he took several courses from Daniel Fuller and through him discovered the writings of our buddy Jonathan Edwards, our homeboy. <laughs> Along with C.S. Lewis, Edwards and Fuller are noted influences in Piper's life and ministry. Uh, Piper got a Doctor of Theology degree in New Testament studies at the University of Munich. His dissertation, Love Your Enemies, was published by Cambridge, Press University, Cambridge University Press, Baker Bookhouse. Upon completion of his doctorate, he taught biblical studies at Bethel University and Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota for six years, and that would be from 1974 to 1980. All right, so that's our buddy, John Piper. All right, let's go to the next guy. C.J. Mahaney, also known as Charles Joseph Mahaney, also known as C.J., and for those who know him well, affectionately call him Siege. C.J. Mahaney is the founding pastor of Covenant Life Church in Gaithersburg, Maryland. He is currently the pastor of Sovereign Grace Church in Louisville, Kentucky. He is the former president of Sovereign Grace Ministries, which was formerly People of Destiny International, PDI. Um, and he resigned from Sovereign Grace Ministries in 2013. We won't rehash the whole history and um, conspiracy that it was involved with that debacle. Uh, C.J. Mahaney's net worth is listed as se at $750,000 or more, more than $750,000, and it includes stocks, properties, luxury goods such as yachts and private airplanes. He is the author of at least 12 books 
Um, some of his more well-known ones include The Cross-Centered Life and Proclaiming a Cross-Centered Theology. C.J. Mahaney's affiliations are Southern Baptist Convention and also he is affiliated with Together for the Gospel. Okay, next guy. John MacArthur, also known as, I like to call him J-Mac. Some people call him Johnny Mac. John MacArthur is currently the pastor at Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California. Um, of course, everybody should be familiar with his Grace to You radio program that's been on syndicated radio for years and years and years and years and years. I remember growing up, you know, going in, in the 80s, my parents used to listen to him on Christian radio religiously every morning. Former president of Masters College, which was formerly called ba Los Angeles Baptist College, and in 1986 he founded Masters Seminary as an offshoot of Masters College. John MacArthur's net worth is listed as over $12 million, and he receives an annual salary of $160,000. He has, now I found that this is astounding. He has written or edited over 150 books. Now, included in that list of books are not just books that he's authored, but you're going to include things like his commentaries, his study Bibles. So, anything that's got his name included in there is going to have, is going to be included in this list. But still, 150 is an, is an astounding number. His academic and theological pedigree includes Bob Jones University. He was there for a short stint, and then he transferred to Los Angeles Pacific College, which is now called Azusa Pacific University. In 1960, I didn't actually, did, I didn't know he went to Bob Jones. I, that, was new, that was new to me. In 1963, he obtained his Master's of Divinity from Biola University's Talbot Theological Seminary, graduating with honors. From 1964 to 1966, he served as an associate pastor at Calvary Bible Church in Burbank, California. And from 1966 to 1969, he served as a faculty, a faculty representative for Talbot Theological Seminary. Our good buddy J Mac, good old Johnny C, or Johnny M, not Johnny C. Okay. All right. Uh, Paul David Tripp. Um, <laughs> he is a trip. Um, he's got a website, um, and you see that look. He's got his own app. You can download your own app. Your own Paul David Tripp, and it looks like he dropped the David part, so he's just Paul Tripp now. He's only going by Paul Tripp. I guess, isn't that, don't they list like serial killers and, 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 and presidential assassins are all known by their three names, like Lee Harvey Oswald, John Wilkes Booth? Yeah. Okay, so maybe he's trying to avoid that negative connotation with the three names. I don't know. But yeah, go ahead and download your Paul David Tripp app today. Um, He's, um, look, it says here he's he's the pastor is a pastor, author, and confederate conference speaker, connecting the transforming power of Jesus Christ to everyday life. My question is, does he really believe that? <laughs> right? Does that mean does he really believe that? Trans the transforming power of Jesus Christ to everyday life. Um, he has written more than 30 books and video series on Christian living. Of course, his most well-known book is How People Change by Not Really Changing at All. That's not actually part of the title. I just added that in there. Uh, of affiliations. you got to love this picture. Can we really take a person seriously that looks like this? I mean, really. Can we get with the not? Can we get with the with the? This is a, we're almost 2020. Can we get with get away from this 1970s hipster look? Um, affiliations: Desiring God, uh, Crossway. There is 
He's also got an, uh, uh, a nonprofit organization called Paul Tripp Ministries Incorporated. It is also a 501c3. It is stated to, its stated purpose is connecting the transforming power of Jesus Christ to everyday life through the writings and teachings of Dr. Paul David Tripp. It was officially incorporated on June 19th, 2006. Tripp's theological pedigree uh, included Columbia Bible College, now Columbia International University, where he majored in Bible and Christian education. He went on to receive his Masters of Divinity from the Reformed Episcopal Seminary, and his Doctor of um, his Doctor of Mi uh, I guess I think I have an abbreviation. Here. I think it's Doctor of Ministries in Biblical Counseling from Westminster Theological Seminary. He was a faculty member at the Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation, also known as the CCEF, for many years. He was a lecturer in Biblical Counseling at Westminster Theological Seminary, a visiting professor at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and a pastor at 10th Presbyterian Church. Paul David Tripp is known as the who's is known as in the who's who of the biblical counseling movement. He's a very large player in that movement. All right, next one. Oh, you didn't give his net worth. Uh, it's because I couldn't find it. Uh, you'd be surprised how hard it, how difficult it is to track down the 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 net worth of a lot of these guys. They're very protective about how much money they owe, they, they make, about how much money they have. Al Moeller, also known as Big Al, as I like to call him. Big Al, president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. His net worth is approximately $3.5 million. Now, I, what I've found out is a lot of these guys who are involved in, either in, in some kind of seminary or some college that they're affiliated with somehow, uh, their information is public record, so it is very easy to find some of these guys, so that's why we can easily track his net worth. 3.5 million. Al Moore's affiliations include monergism.com, which is a Calvinist website, Calvinist reformed website. This, this next point is interesting. L listen to this. He is a founding fellow of the Research Institute of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. That's a mouthful. Let me read that again. He is a founding fellow of the Research Institute of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, or ERLC for short. The ERLC, listen to this, follow me now. The ERLC is a public policy arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, why is that important, you may ask? Well, it's important because you have to dig to find this. The ERLC is registered as a non-government organization with the United Nations. Let me say that again. The ERLC is registered as a non-government organization with the UN. Now, why, what does that mean? Okay. <clears throat> that means they're on the UN watch list. Now, typically, watch lists are bad things. Mm -hmm. But this watch list is actually a good thing because you don't get put on this UN watch list as a non-government organization unless the UN approves of you in some way. And in order for the UN to approve you, that means there's a whole standard of policies and uh, beliefs, for lack of a better word, I might say, in other words, you've got to agree with the UN's philosophical ideologies. 
And of course, the UN is their main philosophical ideology is a one world agenda. Mm. Right. So the fact now you connect the dots, Al Mohler is a founding fellow of a research organization that is on a government watch list that is approved by the UN. Okay, there's a there's a strong there is a strong affiliation there, strong association there. I didn't mean to stop this. That should be frightening. That should send up some red flags. Mm -hmm. uh, Al Mohler's theological and academic pedigree. Mohler attended college at Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton as a faculty scholar, and then he received a Bachelor of Arts degree from Samford University, which is a private co-educational Baptist affiliated college. His Master's of Divinity and Doctor of Philosophy degrees, notice that Doctor of Philosophy, he has a degree in philosophy, uh, in systematic and historical theology were conferred by the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He is the host of the Albert Moeller Program, a nationwide radio show. He produces a weekly podcast on the news called The Briefing, in which he provides commentary on current events from a Christian worldview. He is a former vice chairman of the board of Focus on the Family, and that is Cold. No, who's the guy? Who's his name? Dobson. Dobson. Yeah. Yeah, James Dobson. Uh, He's also a member of the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womenhood, whatever that means. All right, now, after taking a look at some of these guys, we should start to see some patterns, uh, some common characteristics among them. Now, what are some of these patterns? They're rich. Yeah. Well, they're rich, yeah, incredibly wealthy. Um, I, I, I've got nothing against being wealthy, okay? <clears throat> I'm a capitalist, okay? I've got nothing against being wealthy. I do have a big problem about where you get your wealth from. How you obtain it. Are you working for it? Are you producing something, either uh, manufacturing or intellectually, that, that, that's, a, that's a reflection of your production, your mind, and being, you know, exchanging that? Or are you getting it in some unscrupulous manner? Okay. But yes, they write books. A lot of books. A lot of books. These guys, these are, they are prolific writers. But I think the thing that should be most apparent is the, they put a lot of stock in their academic and their intellectual and their theological pedigrees. They want you to know who they are, where they went to school, why they're qualified to be an authority over you. We're going back to the expertism now, okay, that Paul mentioned. Okay. And this last point is mostly what I'm going to focus on around for the remainder of my series because it is so closely tied with authority. Okay. Now, church leaders are going to tell you that the reason they have authority is because of some vague interpretation of Hebrews 13, 17. Of course, John Calvin gave us this notion of the power of the keys. And then there was this whole argument about apostolic succession that happened at the close of the first century. And for the last 2,000 years, church people have just blindly accepted this notion of authority. Mm -hmm. So we look at all the problems that are happening in churches today, and we scratch our heads. You have the survival and discernment blogs bemoaning abuse of authority in churches, whining about symptoms. Oh, if we just get the right kind of leadership. Oh, if we just get the right kind of church polity in place. If we just get the right system of accountability. All these problems will get fixed. Folks, this is only addressing symptoms and not the root problem. I want to give credit 
And John's not here yet, but he's hopefully will be with us later today and tomorrow. But I want to give credit and the utmost thanks to John Immel for what he has taught me personally. Camera. Camera. Thank you. Yeah, I just heard a beep. I want to give credit and the utmost thanks to John Immel for what he has taught me personally over the past five or six years in attending these conferences, listening to his talks here at the, at the conferences. And I'm so grateful for uh, his knowledge, and all the study and hard work that he has put in. He has really helped me gain so much understanding of the kind of thinking that leads to the behaviors that we see in churches. And it's not just in churches. It's, uh, it, it's, this, is in, this applies to the secular and political realm as well. There is no difference between politics and religion because they are two sides of the same philosophical conclusions. Religion is politics, politics is right. religion. It's, it's use of force. It determines, it, it is a prescribed force control. for control. So in philosophy, in philosophy, you have uh, these five disciplines. We're all familiar with, all of us here at Tank are familiar with these. We have these five disciplines that form a progression of thought from assumption to conclusion. You've got metaphysics, which is the study of existence and reality. I'm going to be echoing John here. Study of existence and reality. Epistemology, which is how we know what we know. Ethics, how we value what we know. Politics, how man interacts with others. And that, and we just described that that pre, that prescribes force, okay? And then aesthetics, how man reflects that philosophy back to the world around him. Now, some time ago, I decided that I was going to work through the progression of these philosophical disciplines and try to come up with a useful chart that would summarize the progression of thought from different metaphysical assumptions. I wanted to come up with some way that we could do a helpful comparison. For example, if one is an individualist or has an individualist philosophy, what must that progression of thought look like? If one is a collectivist, what must that progression of thought look like? And what I discovered, well, I didn't really discover it. I knew this, but I, you know, I knew this after putting all this together. But I wanted to show the progression of thought and have a comparison. And so this is what I came up with here. Now, you're probably not going to be able to see this very well. And on a camera, you're not probably going to be able to see this very well. I have published this on the blog on Paul's Passing Thoughts in the past. And if anybody wants a link to this, or if you want a physical copy of this, I can provide that to you. Okay? So drop us an email. Let, let us know. Okay? Leave a comment somewhere. Or just go to Pal Paul's Passing Thoughts, and you can do a search for contrasting philosophical ideologies. Um, but I want you to follow the progression of thought of the collectivists, specifically here. So this column. Okay? You, can you can read these on your own and compare them, but I want to go through this collective, the collectivist assumptions. Beginning with metaphysics, for the collectivist, Man is existentially evil. Do, I, do we understand what I mean when I say existentially? Existential, what's it, what word, word do we have in the word existential? Exist, existence. Okay, so when we have, when I say the word existential, we're dealing with reality and existence. Okay, so he, man is, his existence, his mere existence is evil and fundamentally flawed. Okay, that's the, that's the metaphysical assumption. And therefore, he has no ability. This is the metaphysical premise. This is the reality, or at least this is the reality that they want you to accept. This is what the collectivist is trying to get you to believe about the world around you. Regardless of what you think, regardless of what you think you know, or can perceive with your own senses, what your eyes see, what your ears hear, what your mind can think, you cannot trust your senses because they are flawed in some fundamental way. This metaphysical premise results in an epistemological conclusion, which is this. Because man is fundamentally flawed, 
His depravity and fundamental flaws make him unable to discern truth. Therefore, truth must be dictated to him from some authority, ruling class, or religious figure, despot, tyrant, pastor, okay, elder. This is where the philosopher king comes into play. There is some elect class of elites who somehow get a metaphysical pass from total depravity. They have some special calling that gives them the right to force their view of reality upon you. The result is a system of ethics, which is where we derive values. What is valuable to the collectivist? Since truth is dictated by authority, any value derived as a result of truth, or the dictated truth, is only relevant insofar as it benefits the collective. Because the individual has no value, only the collective is valued. Man's depravity and inability means he has no value. Any value he can possibly hope to contribute is only found in sacrificing himself for the benefit of the collective. Now, naturally, some people are going to want to rebel against this kind of value system. So, a rigid class structure is needed in order to compel man to operate within those ethical assumptions. Well, and I'm, I might quickly add that the whole purpose of the collective is to support the state. Yeah. Okay. So it isn't this. Well, the collective is the state. Yeah. Well. The 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 state the state is politics. Right. Okay. Collectivism is an ideology. More more than more than anything else. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it manifests itself in this political force of mm -hmm. the state. Right. Okay. So you have to have this rigid class structure to compel man to operate within this ethical assumption. Um, an authority is needed to use force against man mm -hmm. when necessary, lest he make the mistake of assuming that he can do anything for himself right. outside of the collective, or that anything that he does for himself is of any value to himself or anyone else. And ultimately, you will see the impact of this progression of thought manifest itself one way or another in artistic expression. Cultural expressions in a collectivist state represent a tribute to the collective and some notion of utopian prestige. It speaks to what the collective values the most. Now, why are there all these problems in churches? Why are all these problems in churches today? This is not a new development. Hmm. This is the kind of thing that has been happening for thousands of years. Why? Because it follows this pattern of thought. From metaphysics all the way down to politics and even into aesthetics. And if you don't believe, ask yourself why is the cross a central icon in church, in Christianity? The cross is a, an icon, is an artistic representation of what? Sacrifice. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay? Pain and death and suffering. Now, for the remainder of my series, I'm going to give you a couple of examples from the New Testament. And we're going to look at them in depth. In my next session, we'll look at an example with Paul from the book of Acts. The Apostle Paul, not Paul Dempsey. Mm -hmm. And then in, that, in the session after that, I have a great case study in religious authority from the Gospel of John. But for now, I want to close out this session uh, by looking at some passages of Scripture. And I might comment on these as we go through them, but uh, I think they speak for themselves. I think it's just best to let you, we'll just read them and let them resonate with you and let you draw your own conclusions. Uh, these are all memes that I have posted on Paul's passing thoughts at some point, at one point or another over the past year or so. Um, as I go through these, you guys are free to chime in and comment about if one of these happens to resonate with you. Um, this first one here. This is Ezekiel 34, 2 through 4. Son of man, prophesy against... Now, son of man, is, of course, is, would be the prophet Ezekiel. 
me, God is speaking to Ezekiel. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye bought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. He actually goes on a little bit further down in verses uh, 7 through 10. Therefore, my shepherds, Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord, as I live, saith the Lord God. Surely, because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds. And I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth. They may not be meat for them. Mm. Those are stern words. And he repeated it. And when God repeats, that's very, you know, thus, therefore, saith the Lord God. And mm -hmm. then that, thus saith the Lord God. When he repeats himself, you better take notice. Okay. And you notice there's a reason I used the background that I did. Yes. <laughs> okay. Your favorite. Reason. Is it obvious? What the shepherds okay. are doing? Yeah. Does it, any of this apply today? Okay. Next one. Matthew 23, 4 through 7. That Jesus says, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Talk about the cultural elitism, this special class of enlightened individuals who, because of their enlightenment, they have the, the right to rule over everyone else. But somehow, moral, the moral depravity and the, and the total depravity that they put on everybody else somehow doesn't apply to them. They get a pass on that. But with all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And they love the, they love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi, Teacher, Teacher. And they love to get together at pastor's conferences and pat themselves on the back and tell each other what a great job they're doing and talk about how stupid that we are, that how stupid the lady is. Romans 16, 17 and 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Jeremiah 23, 1. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Micah 3, 9-11. through 11. Hear this, I pray you, ye heads of the house of Jacob and princes of the house of Israel that abhor judgment and pervert all equity. No justice. Okay? There's no justice available. What, what do we hear in, in churches these days when it comes to those who are abused? Sexual abuse that happens in the church. Uh -huh. Spiritual abuse that happens right. in the church. The perp gets a pass and the victim is made uh -huh. to feel victimized all over again and the right. victim is the one at fault for not being forgiving and demanding justice for what happened to them they build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity the heads thereof judge for reward and the priests thereof teach for hire and the prophets thereof divine for money yet 
will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. I added this one in just recently. Second Peter 2, chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Many shall follow their pernicious ways, and by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness they shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. That phrase, make merchandise, mm -hmm. literally has to do in, in context when Peter was speaking, this is talking about the trading of slaves. Hmm. Okay? Slave trading was the biggest commodity in mm -hmm. that time. Okay? So this is literally talking about you're good, they're going to treat you as chattel on the open market. Right. Okay? And if you know anything about commodities trading, trading to them, you're no more than... Uh -huh. Then soybeans, a bushel of soybeans, a bushel of corn, pork bellies. Okay, you're gonna, they're gonna trade you like a commodity, and make merchandise of you. And then let me just follow. Let me just close with this one. Um, Ecclesiastes 12, the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. And further by these, my son, be admonished. Of making many books, there is, there is no, no end. end. <laughs> Much study. Much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and what? Keep his commandments. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or whether it be evil. These guys are prolific writers. There is no end to it at all. Book after book after book after book after book. And Comments. They, and their books really create a weariness. Because I've read, Paul has written more than I have, but I've read sections of some of these books of Piper and all this, and they are not edifying. The material is not edifying to the building up and making me want to desire to keep God's commandments and uh, and really uh, delight more in knowing God. Mm -hmm. The way that uh, Scripture tells us to have that delight and joy in knowing God. It's so, these, these men, what they write, leaves you with such a feeling of hopelessness that mm. there is no hope for me ever to be better in the eyes of God, ever. And you're always looking for the next book to come and out. And the next book to give me answers on how can, how can I be different, how can I be better, how can I be more like Christ. How can I be who God wants me to be? And so you're always laying down the money to buy another book mm -hmm. and never getting mm -hmm. an answer. Mm -hmm. No. And, and when all it is is where does this, where do the answers truly lie in fearing God and keeping His commandments? In His Word, mm -hmm. not in the words of men, but in His Word. Mm -hmm. That's where uh, our whole duty is. Mm -hmm. So just this is where I'm going with this. I mean, we, uh, by the time we're done here, I mean, I think we already know this, but the more I read Scripture and the more I see examples of this, I just, I'm blown away. I'm like, this, this is nothing new. It's nothing new. God was talking about these things, admonishing and rebuking the religious leadership, the religious authority about their abuse of authority 
thousands of years ago. And all it is today is just repackaged. And what the ironic part about it is, is these same guys will stand up and, and talk about how rotten the Pharisees were. And I'm just like, can't you guys see? Can't, not, not them, but the people who are sitting in church listening to these guys. It's like, you read this, you're reading the same Bible I am. Well, of course, no, maybe not because they're reading an ESV <laughs> and I'm reading the King James. But you're reading the same words I'm reading. You can't see this same thing happening right in front of your eyes. I mean, let's wake up to this, people. They're not allowed to, because if you look, listen to James McDonald, if they do take the blinders off and confront the pastor based upon the truth of God's word, then they are condemned to hell by the pastor. And James McDonald says that, that he has the authority mm -hmm. to take away their salvation mm -hmm. because they have questioned one of God's called. Mm -hmm. I'm counting to ten to see if anybody else wants to say anything. Three, two, one. Okay. That's all I have for, for right now. Thank you. So yeah, I need to know it? what your lunch schedule is. What? So that 21? Oh, well, I got done less than I did that less than an hour. Mm -hmm. I, thought I, was, I thought I was going on too long. Well, it's, 12, it's about 12.30 right now. It's 12.30. So, when do you want the next session to start? Well, that depends on what you're going to do with lunch. Well, I, I'm I think we could eat lunch. Huh? I'm ready to eat lunch. I can okay. throw it through the window there. If I there you go. Somebody <laughs> opens the window. <laughs> I'll set the schedule accordingly. It's just Susie Subways. Okay. I'm going to eat mine down here in front of the monitor and, and hammer out uh, the rest of the schedule. Hey, Flippers, do you have time to take... take uh, Valerie outside before she has a barking fit. Yeah, she's already been out. Because you know, if I head the down the hallway, then she's going to start barking like a fool because she, she knows what the word outside she means. Didn't, she didn't want to come back in. Look at that wiggle waggle. Mm -hmm. Outside. Come here. That's a happy dog right there. That's my learner. Did you outside? You love your grandma, don't you? <laughs> you love your grandma. Mm -hmm. Let's see the Ha, ha, ha.
Oh, one, right? 